some of the sort of responses uh, to stress uh, reside in the capability of the symbionts, almost certainly. So without further ado, we'll hear about the black box of symbiodinium genomics. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I suppose, prefaced some of the introductory talks that I want to give is to sort of set out some of the problems that we have when we're actually trying to look at symbiodinium from a molecular point of view and understand what the genome is about and what the transcriptomics are about. So um, I thought I'd just put this up and it sort of repeats sort of the stuff that Simon had up. We're concentrating in my lab looking at the symbiodinium, so the intracellular algae that we find inside corals. And if we look at actually the simply the metabolic interplay between the dinoflagellate and the coral host, it's actually very complex. And what we know is that, as Simon said, we can have a variety of inorganic car uh, compounds that will come in. They'll eventually make their way to symbiodinium where a complex series of metabolic processes will go on. And then these algae will export to the coral host a variety of different metabolites, whether they're sugars, glycerol, amino acids, or lipids. And this really, this metabolite work is really what's been going on for sort of 40 years and it's kicked off with some of the basic interplays about what is the symbiosis. So the problem that we have though is when we want to look at what the response of symbiodinium, symbiodinium or zooxanthellae are in a coral symbiosis is that we don't really have a lot of tools that we can actually use to see how they're responding. So we can for instance do something like C14 tracing and look at how much carbon is being moved from one step to the other we could look at something like photosynthesis and see how much oxygen is being produced. But it's very difficult to get a handle on what actually is the response of symbiodinium to a variety of stresses. So the approach that I've taken is to try and link a genomics approach to an ecological approach. So if we think about an organism undergoing stress, in this case we can look at something like temperature, we're going to have an ecological response where that temperature change will induce a change in distribution and abundance, changes in species interactions, changes in community structure. But there's also going to be a genomic response where that temperature response is going to introduce an integration of that temperature signal, induce gene expression changes, and then we can look, as for instance Aurelie has been doing, looking at the profile of gene expressions. And these changes here will generate differential performance which will drive these changes here. We can also use these changes to actually give us some information about what some of the genes are doing. Sounds simple. The problem comes about, though, is when we just want to start looking at that in terms of symbiodinium, is that we're starting from a very low starting point. So when we started this work now, probably about five or six years ago, we knew a total of 32 different genes. Not a lot to go on. So even now, we've been doing this stuff now for about five years. This group here is the, the order that symbiodinium belong to. We now know somewhere in the order of about eight to 9,000 genes. And we're really the poor cousins of the symbiosis if we look at what we know about sclerotinian corals now. The number of genes is somewhere up around 150,000. There'll be a coral genome available soon, so this will obviously increase. Dinoflagellates as a group are actually really poorly studied. So it's a very large group, but the class dinoflagellate, we only know somewhere in the order of about 200,000 genes. And we can compare that to the anthozoans, which is what sclerotinian corals belong to and they're somewhere sitting now about 350,000. And in comparison, we can look at perhaps everybody's favourite study organism, which is humans, and that's somewhere in the order of about 8.5 million sequences or ESTs are now available, in addition to the human genome. So if we want to start utilising a genomic approach to symbiodinium, we have to start finding out what's actually in the genome. Complicating the fact, not only do we not know a lot about it, they're actually very strange beasts. So if we look at the genome itself, it's actually very large anywhere between 3 billion base pairs and 215 billion base pairs. To put that in some sort of context, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs. So I'm lucky enough to work on an organism that has a genome at least as complex as humans, and it's all in a single cell. We've got no idea what all this genome, genomic information is doing. There's also been a couple of recent studies that have come out suggesting that gene numbers in terms of using some regression analysis and some, and some um, high throughput sequencing, suggests that dinoflagellates have anywhere between 38,000 and 88,000 genes. Again, putting that in context, humans have between 20 and 25,000. Luckily enough for us, if we look at dinoflagellates as a whole, and this is actually looking at genome size or how much DNA they have, symbiodinium is probably the dinoflagellate with the smallest amount of genome, genomic information. So there's one bright part to it. Complicating matters even further, these guys actually use five DNA bases as opposed to four, so they have a modified base pair. They have very complex RNA editing mechanisms, 
And what we did know about the gene complement of Symbiodinium and Dinoflagellus when we started this work is that they have a complex system of genes that aren't found in other normal photoautotrophs. So Rubisco, which is the protein involved in carbon fixation, is not the same as what we find in pretty much every other photosynthetic organism. It matches what we find in purple non-sulfur bacteria that live in hot springs. So they're very strange beasts. And some of that comes about from the fact that although we think of dinoflagellates as being algae, they're actually not true algae. Half of dinoflagellates aren't photosynthetic. So dinoflagellates have actually acquired the ability to photosynthesize through a series of endosymbiotic events. Chloroplasts originally arose, arose from a primary endosymbiosis, which gave us our green algae and our high plants, and a second lineage that gave us red algae. And then through a series of engulfment uh, processes, we ended up with a variety of other algae, and then finally dinoflagellates are down the bottom here. So they've gone through and engulfed another eukaryotic organism to actually establish a chloroplast. So what this complex genome means and this complex evolution of the chloroplast is that it's very difficult to extrapolate from other algae into what's happening with symbiodinium. Now, why do we care? Well, as has been mentioned before, is that particularly if we're looking at thermal stress now, it seems that symbiodinium is possibly the most thermally sensitive partner in the symbiosis. There's been a variety of different hypotheses put through indicating where this thermal stress may occur, anywhere from the uptake of CO2 to rubisco to light harvesting complexes to lipid membranes. If we want to get to the understanding of which of these processes is actually the thermally sensitive one, we need to understand what proteins are there. In addition to that, complicating matters even further is that but this is the group dinoflagellates, symbiodinium is a complex group in themselves. So they can be divided up into nine separate clades, and within these clades is genetic diversity. We're concentrating on clade C because that's the dominant symbiodinium type in the Indo-Pacific. And then within clade C, there's a variety of diversities here. And the important point is that each of these, or we find very distinct physiological differences within this clade. So this is not simply a matter of fine-scale genetic diversity, these are actually different physiological responses. So what I wanted to talk about briefly today is just three sort of topic areas, just sort of giving you an overview of the sort of research that we're doing. Initially talking about a project now that's been going on a while, for a while, which is sort of characterising the symbiodinium transcriptome, working out what genes are present and then comparing between different symbiodinium strains. An example of some of the work, we're actually taking that data now and actually doing much more in-depth analysis of particular gene families and then taking the information that we know about the genes and trying to actually use that information to look at what's the functional responses of symbiodinium, in particular integrating that into the coral holobiont model. So this is work that I started off in Ove's lab um, and has been published now for a while. Just to give you a background, we started looking at a particular symbiodinium strain C3. We did an EST study, so we stressed corals, we isolated the RNA and we sequenced it. And we ended up with somewhere in the order of about 7,000 sequences. And when we assembled these, we ended up with a little bit under 4,000 different complete gene sequences or partial gene sequences. And this is probably a little bit of an overestimation because some of these may actually encode for the same thing. If you think about the size of the transcriptome, which was about 40,000 sequences, you can see we've still only got, if we're lucky, 10% of the genes that are there. When we then did some bioinformatic analysis on these genes, we found that 57% of them didn't match anything in the database in terms of we couldn't work out what the function was. 18% of these genes we could actually assign some sort of function to, so we could start saying these genes do this particular function. So we can start then, for instance, looking at those as targets. Interestingly enough, about 3% of these genes were much more closely related to bacteria than any other algae or any other eukaryote, and it seems to indicate there's possibly horizontal gene transfer going on. And there's now a lot of other work coming out in dinoflagellates seeming to indicate that they can take up or incorporate DNA through horizontal gene transfer. And interestingly enough, a number of these are involved in stress responses. So we have some projects looking at those now, but I'm not going to talk about them. Again, we can take that information and we can break it up into a variety of different parameters. So we can look at genes involved in metabolism, photosynthesis, et cetera, et cetera. So it's now starting to give us a framework where we can start taking this information and start asking some interesting questions about what are the responses of symbiodinium. Um, Continuing that work on now, using some of the more newer, the newer technologies, we've now started to use high-throughput sequencing, as Dave's done for the coral system. Um, this is an ongoing work, and we're about to do some more of this. But to put things in perspective, this was one 454 run that we did. We now ended up with somewhere in the order of about 44,000 different contigs. Again, this is an overestimation, because some of these will be 
partial sequences to the same gene, but we're now starting to increase our information knowledge or information base about what symbiodinium can do. And what we can do, which makes that interesting, is we can then start overlaying that information onto metabolic maps. So this is just a basic metabolic map. Each of these dots represents a particular chemical compound, and each line represents an enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. And we can start filling in this metabolic map and working out which genes are present, which proteins are present, and we can start targeting those if we're interested in that particular pathway. Now, in addition to that, we have an interest in comparing between different symbiodinium strains. And while we were doing our initial EST work, Monica Medina in the University of California was also doing something similar. And as I said, we work on clade C. She was working on clade A, which is sort of the basal group of symbiodinium. And it gave us the opportunity then to compare between these two symbiodinium strains and see how similar are they. The data sets were, we had about 3,000 sequences or 3,300. They had a little bit over 1,300 sequences. And we simply compared the two and see what sort of overlap we got. And surprisingly enough is that we actually only found 115 genes were expressed in both clade C3 at this particular point in clade A1, and A1. Which, if we think about now what we're getting in terms of estimates of gene number, it's perhaps not surprising if we've only got 10% of the genes here. And here we've got perhaps less than um, two, uh, three or four percent. What we did do, though, is that we took these genes and divided them up into different categories, and we worked out which genes we find in all eukaryotes, those that are only dinoflagellate-specific and those that were found in symbiodinium, and we examined the rate of evolution of these genes. And interestingly enough, what we found is that those genes that were found only in symbiodinium, and we couldn't find them in any other organisms, were actually under higher or greater positive selection which suggests that these may be involved in a symbiotic relationship and keeping their symbiosis established. So we've got some projects that are now starting to look at these genes here. So the take-home message from this first part is that there's still a large amount of the symbiodinian transcriptome yet to be characterised. They're very complex beasts. There seems to be a very large sequence diversity between symbiodinium, so when we talk about the response of different symbiodinium, it's going to be very complex. We can't say this is what all symbiodinium or all zooxanthellae will do. And these symbiodinium-specific genes seem to be under greater evolutionary pressure, which suggests they may be involved in maintaining or establishing that symbiosis. So as another little sort of cherry pick, I wanted to talk then about a group of a uh, set of projects that we're doing and actually taking a set of genes that we're interested in and actually characterising those in a much more in-depth way. And this is work that one of my PhD students is doing, Linda Bolt, and this is looking at light harvesting proteins. So these particular proteins are proteins that are associated with the harvesting of light energy and transferring it through to chlorophyll. The reason we have an interest in these is that um, obviously they're going to be important if they're involved in taking light energy up, but also they've been linked to thermal sensitivity in symbiodinium. So there's some studies that have come out that suggest, suggest that the expression of these LHC genes is related to the thermal tolerance of the symbiodinium strains that they've come from. We've done partial characterization now, and we've come up with at least 21 different LHC sequences. It's actually much larger than this. We ended up stopping the project. Um, and what we've done then is taken a phylogenetic approach and simply looked at the phylogeny. What is the evolutionary history of these proteins? If we do a phylogenetic tree, and this will be the only one that I'll show you, is that we end up with a green lineage, which makes sense because these are the algae that have got this green chloroplastic lineage here, and we end up with a red algal lineage, which is those guys that come down here. The dogma before we did this study is that the red algal lineage was divided into three groups, a group that has the dinoflagellates in them, a group that has FCP proteins, and a group that has the red, the red algae, and never the twain shall meet. So we wouldn't find an organism that would have a LHC from a dinoflagellate and an LHC from up here. When we looked at symbiodinium, though, and we put our symbiodinium sequences into this sort of phylogeny, we broke that dogma down. And what we found is that symbiodinium LHCs actually are spread throughout this entire group. So we have much more diversity of LHCs of symbiodinium than we found in any other lineage. Um, what does that mean? Well, if we then actually take this a step further and start looking at the structure of these different proteins, we actually find that we end up with very different structures, and this will be the only structural picture I'll put up. These represent how the proteins are organised in the membrane, and we can see just from a very quick look that this structure here is very different to this one here because we've got this extra transmembrane domain here, and this has another one here. 
this idea of these structures, although they might not look very significant, actually mean that we may be getting very different functions in these LHCs. So these diverse structures may mean that they're functioning differently in terms of how they're harvesting light or whether they're involved in photoprotection. It also has thrown up some other questions, is that how do these different LHC groups here respond to stress? And we're looking at that now. Do they have different functions? And how does symbiodinium go about assembling their light harvesting complexes or their photosystems with this huge diversity of proteins available? So we've got at least 21 different sequences. Higher plants have 12 in total. So we're again looking at a situation where it's much more complex than what we're looking at for higher plants or green algae. Finally, I just wanted to touch on now probably the, the last work that we're doing and this coming out most recently, and I think it's probably some of the more interesting stuff, is that we now want to incorporate this genomic data and start looking at the responses of symbiodinium in association with the coral holobiont. So this was some work that we did with Tracy, and what we did was a simple heating experiment, and we wanted to use the genomic information that we had from corals, and now our genomic information from symbiodinium, and compare the responses to the two. Are they behaving in the same sort of way? So we did an a increasing temperature. This is the results from a pa the PAM, or looking at how healthy the photosystems are. And the important point to see is that we actually haven't got to this bleaching threshold yet. So the symbiosis still seems to be going on quite happily. So we haven't induced bleaching. We haven't induced a lot of damage that we can measure with the current uh, PAM technology, which is one of the ways that we normally look at bleaching. If we looked at the response of the coral, and this is the HSP data. Tracy showed you some of this before. We looked at two particular isoforms, HSP90, HSP70. These are stress response genes. And unsurprisingly, when we did a heating experiment, even though we're not seeing a bleaching response, we got an increase in the expression of these genes, which makes sense. We're stressing them, they're increasing their stress response genes. Interestingly enough, though, when we looked at symbiodinium, we didn't see this pattern at all. So we got a very flat level, and we got really one, only one data point here where we had a significant difference between our control and our treatments. If I change the scale of this and actually put it on the same scale as this, you can see the genomic response, the transcriptomic response of symbiodinium, is really nothing compared to what we're seeing in the coral. So they're not behaving in the same way. Now, we wanted to extend it just beyond these stress response genes where we were interested in metabolism. So we then wanted to go and look at some of these metabolic genes that we'd previously mapped from symbiodinium and we also had available from the coral literature and see how the metabolism of the two partners was um, behaving, whether they're behaving the same. And I just want to give you one example of some of the genes that we looked at, and we looked at uh, quite a few of them. But this is the response of alpha-ketoglutarate and uh, gap dh because they had 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. This is a metabolic map. This is where these two particular proteins sit. And what we see is that as we increase temperature, we got an increase in the expression of these two genes in the coral host, increasing and probably indicating probably greater metabolic rates. But again, if we looked at the response for symbiodinium, we didn't see that pattern at all again. Again, no significant changes for what was occurring. So we seem to be getting responses in the coral at a transcriptomic level, much earlier than what we've got from symbiodinium. So we've got an increase in gene expression, and this pattern was repeated in a number of genes that we looked at. So we seem to be detecting changes in gene expression in the coral host before we get bleaching, indicating again that these pre-bleaching events may be important. And then finally, last slide to finish off, which is sort of where we're going now with this work, is that we're starting and we're further characterising the transcriptome but we're now starting to go looking further downstream and we're now just establishing collaborations with Ames and some groups in Italy to actually start looking at the metabolome. So to actually start measuring what's the concentration of these different metabolites here and using them as an indication of how our symbiosis is changing and link that to our transcriptomic responses. So finally, there's been a number of people involved in this, Dave Yellies, Tracy, the Monica Medina's group, Ove and Sophie, which is where the EST sequencing really started off. Um, Linda Blackall and Mario Giordano, who is in, being, going to be involved.